All right, I want to welcome everybody to another episode of the Shadows Podcast. Here, I'm your host, Trip Bodenheimer. I'm very excited to have a special guest with us here today, Chad Hennings. He is a U.S. Air Force Academy graduate. He is a U.S. Air Force fighter pilot, three-time Super Bowl champ with the Dallas Cowboys, Christian motivational speaker, entrepreneur, author. Quite a resume that you have there, sir. Welcome to the show. Trip, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. We're looking forward to this. So before we get started, uh, let's let's go back to your your upbringing. You were born October 20th, 1965. Uh, tell our audience about your uh, your childhood. Going all the way back to the beginning. Huh? No, <laughs> I was very fortunate. I was born, uh, well, raised on a farm, a family farm in Iowa. The farm has been in our family for over 135 years. So I wow. have was very privileged and blessed to be able to work side by side with my father, my grandfather. I learned a lot about the aspects of commitment, about work ethic, about perseverance, a lot of great traits um, that I learned from them. You know, growing up also with in a you know semi-large family with my siblings, it, it taught me a lot about what it means to be a success. And with that, a lot of those life skills translated into the classroom and then you know, on the athletic field and, uh, you know, help prepare me for you know, who I am in life today. Yeah. And you can definitely see as your career unfolds, that makes a lot of sense, your upbringing uh, to where it got you. What made you decide to join the Air Force? You know, actually it was, uh, I wanted to play division one college football. I grew up in a small rural community, as I said, in Iowa and never really had a lot of uh, access to recruiters, didn't have a lot of uh, looks from other colleges until I won the state championship heavyweight wrestling title my senior year. That's when a lot of the Big Ten schools in the local area, Big Eight schools at the time, started to take a look at me for football. And by then I was committed to the Air Force Academy. And one of the reasons why I wanted to go to the academy was I wanted to have a, an experience unlike I would have had if I've gone to a traditional school. I knew I wanted to play Division One college athletics. Square field there. The academy had a really a, a great up and coming team. They had been to a couple of bowl games at that point in time. I wanted to have an opportunity to have an education, a holistic education, like uh, I wouldn't have at you know other institutions of higher learning. And then I wanted the aspect to have that experience of of the Air Force, to learn leadership traits, to have the exposure, to have a job. Yeah. upon graduation, you know, all these different things. And for the Academy, who can beat 18,000 acres on the front range of the Colorado Rockies? It is nice. Probably one of the most beautiful campuses, you know, in our country. And to wake up every morning, seeing the, the Colorado landscape, it was a great place to go to school. Yeah, and you, you made quite an impact there. You uh, moved to defensive tackle your sophomore season, became a starter made the all Western athletic conference, the WAC second team, that 85 season was the greatest season in air force history that y'all went 12 and one and were a conference co-champs and defeated Texas in the blue bonnet bowl and placed fifth in the coaches poll. What do you remember most about that team? Uh, it was, a, you know, the one thing that one of my favorite pictures I actually have hanging in my office is a picture on the defensive side of the ball, when I was at the academy that year of 11 guys in on one tackle. So all 11 guys in the whole defense were in one tackle. And that's, you know, you never see that. And it's because of, I think, the mentality that we all had that we were undersized compared to the other schools that we were going to play, the University of Texas, the Notre Dame, but we were able to compete and win because we played as one. And that was the, you know, you know, the mentality that carried on for a lot of us then when we went on active duty as, as pilots. And that's what I remember most from that team was just a group of yeah, good athletes, not necessarily great athletes, but played together as one with one purpose, one mission, one goal. And we won. I mean, we were successful, as, as you said. And it ended up being that there were, aside from myself, another college football Hall of Famer player and our coach, Fisher DeBerry, also was inducted to the College Football Hall of Fame here a few years ago. Yeah, and your, your junior year came back, you uh, became a, de a dominant defensive player, you named first team 
uh, all conference. You were a uh, academic all American team, second team all academic uh, WAC conference honors. And then your senior season, you led the nation 24 sacks, first team all American. I mean, what a way to wrap up your career there. Outland Trophy Award winner as well. I could sit here for probably the next 30 minutes and just list off everything that you. Uh, achieved throughout your college career but this really stood out to me is what a, what a good like four-year span even after your playing days were over with in 2004 Colorado Springs Sports Hall of Fame 2005 Colorado Sports Hall of Fame the College Football Hall of Fame in 2006 and then you're in the inaugural class of the Air Force Academic or Academy Athletics Hall of Fame in 2007 just having all of those uh, honors fall on you in the, that four-year span that must have been a great feeling you know, a lot of times when you get in these Hall of Fames, it just means that you're an old guy. <laughs> no, but I was very, you know, I, I was, I was blessed. It was, it was a deep, a great honor to be able to be recognized in that fashion. But what I tell a lot of people when I have the opportunity to address audiences is I never set out to be an All-American. I never mm -hmm. set out to be an Outland Trophy player. I wanted to be the best defensive tackle that I could be at my sport to be the best teammate so we could accomplish wins, victories. And when your teams are successful, you know, a lot of the individual accolades, that stuff all takes care of itself at some point in time. And I was very fortunate to have had phenomenal teammates and I wouldn't have been the tackle that I was or had the accolades that I was, that I had, if it weren't for the guy, the guys, and particularly one guy, Johnny Steve, that the nose guard, the guy that played near me, <clears throat> we always called him a rolling ball of butcher knives because this guy got double teamed, but he was at 225 pounds, you know, way undersized nose guard at division one level. And he was tenacious, but a lot of times because of his play and he was an all conference player himself, you know, allowed me to do what I got to do. So it was, you know, even though I got individual accolades, it was a team sport. Yeah. And this is the part where your journey gets really interesting to me is that you're finishing up your time at the air force Academy but then you were so dominant on the gridiron that you got drafted by the Dallas Cowboys. So for our listeners who don't know your story at this point, uh, you don't mind telling them about what happened with the NFL draft, but yet your commitment to the Air Force as well. Yeah, that, um, you know, this was uncharted territory at the time back in 1988. I think, to my knowledge, there was only one other player that was drafted from a service academy at that point in time was Roger Staubach 20 years earlier, you know, and he had a Hall of Fame career. For the notable Dallas. name. <laughs> yeah, another notable name uh, to our sister academy, the Naval Academy. But for me, at the time, they didn't know what to do with me. I had different scouts as well as different NFL teams reach out to me and ask me, you know, what my status was. I said, you know, I don't know. I'm not going to be eligible to play. I have a minimum of a five-year military commitment, but I chose to up it to eight years because I wanted to fly jets and be a pilot. I had an eight-year pilot training, you know, commitment after pilot training was complete. <clears throat> so technically playing in the NFL was never an option, but the Cowboys took a flyer on me. I was drafted in the 11th round. You know, they don't have 11 rounds anymore, but they, uh, I was glad to sign it because I got a small stipend signing bonus. And I thought as a second lieutenant, soon to be second lieutenant in the Air Force, you know, that helped pay off my debt, helped me buy, you know, pay off my truck and yeah. get out of debt out of college. But it, uh, but I never truly thought I'd ever had the opportunity to play. And then particularly when I was going through pilot training, I went through pilot training at Shepard Air Force Base in Wichita Falls, Texas, which is just an hour and a half outside the Dallas-Fort Worth area. In the fall of the year, Gil Brandt, who's the uh, Cowboys now Hall of Fame player, director of player personnel would send me tickets or put them in will call for me and my buddies to go down to the games. We had 50 yard line seats, sideline passes to watch the games. And for me to watch the guys in my draft class, which were Michael Irvin, Hall of Fame player, Ken Norton yeah. Jr., you know, former all pro uh, play. And, and I'm not able to, I'm watching the side. It, it was tough. Because it was one of those things, Trip, that I knew in, in my head that I had a military commitment. I wanted to be a man of integrity and honor and character, and I needed to fulfill my commitment. But I tell you, by heart, I wanted to compete. I wanted to see if I had oh, yeah. the right stuff to play at the next level. And, and, it, and it was tough. And then trying to fly, learn to fly jets, going through pilot training, which is 
a very stressful period of life in and of itself to throw that on top of it. It was a challenging period of my life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, thank you for your service. Uh, I hear that from people, but I mean, same here to you. Thank you for your service, for everything that you did. You flew uh, A-10s. You were an A-10 pilot. What, what do you remember most about that? You know, the A-10 receiving that was only one of two cockpits at the time that I could fit into from a fighter perspective. It was the F-15 or the A-10. And um, I wanted my first choice was the F-15. You know, who wouldn't want to fly that oh, beast? Yeah you know, from an air to air perspective, but my instructor pilot said, you know what, Chad, your personality, you're better suited to fly the warthog. You're better suited to fly the hog and just, just trust me on this one. So I said, okay. And I received the assignment to fly the A-10 and, you know, they were right. Flying, you know, low and slow. It's, it's a defensive lineman or lineman's dream plane to fly something yeah. that flies. You know, when I flew in a central European scenario, flying missions out of England into Germany, you know, in the old Cold War scenario, we flying anywhere in Germany at 500 feet, you know, going to certain ranges, taking it down to, you know, sub 200 feet, down to 100 feet, getting checked out. It, there's nothing like it in the whole world. And that 30 millimeter Gatling gun to roll in and be able to, you know, shoot a target the size of a, you know, a pie plate mm -hmm. from several thousand feet out. It's, it's awesome. Awesome. So I enjoyed my, my couple of years that I was flying that plane and I was able to participate in the first Gulf War flying missions out of Israel like Turkey, six months there flying into Northern Iraq, supporting it, provide comfort with the Kurds. And man, I was able to have experience at all. Yeah. And your journey from there just keeps, you know, getting more and more interesting because uh, after the Gulf War, military underwent uh, like across the board reduction of budget and you were able to uh, get out of your commitment. It got it waived actually. And you were able to join the Cowboys. What do you remember about that process? You know, it was um, our armed forces went through reduction in force where they waived, you know, not just for me, but everybody across the board, our pilot training commitment, but I had it, you know, which was, eight years, so they waived the three extra off our service academy commitment. But at that point in time too, not enough people were getting out. So they waived 24 months, two years off of our service academy commitment, which then allowed wow. me to, to get out. I can remember, so I went out, I received a phone, living in England, I received a phone call from a, a classmate of mine um, who was flying in the US. And he said, Chad, they just waived our service academy commitments too. You can actually get out. I said, no way. So that next morning I called my, the, the agent, the guy who represented me in my negotiations with the Cowboys. And I said, you know, Jack, I'm eligible to get out. Are the Cowboys still interested in me? Because at this point in time, Jerry Jones had bought the team and Jimmy Johnson was the coach. You know, he bought it in 89, the year after I was drafted by them. So he contacted me and that next, that same night then, again, eight hour difference, time difference being in England from the U.S., received a phone call from my agent said, Hey, the Cowboys want to work you out. They want to see, you know, if you're in shape and kind of who the heck you are, we've got a ticket at we'll call London Heathrow airport for you the next morning. If you're on the plane, you're going to get a workout with the Cowboys the following day. So I got emergency leave from my ops officer granted to me. My wife drove me down from the area of Bentwaters Woodbridge where we were based into London to Heathrow Airport, hopped on a plane, flew the eight hours to Dallas, spent that night uh, when I got in that, you know, early evening talking with Jerry Jones and Stephen Jones and Bobby Ackles, who was the general manager for the Cowboys at the time at my hotel, telling old war stories. And then next morning I was doing my workout. So, you know, literally because of the time change, I'm in the excitement, I'm not even sleeping. I'm thinking, my God, what type of a workout am I going to have the following day? But I end up having one of the best workouts of any person in my position going through the NFL combine at that time. And literally uh, coach Johnson came up to me after I finished the workout and I'm getting ready to head back to the airport. Said, Chad, we like what we see. When can you come join us? I have no idea. I literally, I, I saluted him. I said, <laughs> coach, I don't know, but I'm going to go back and I'll find out. I went back, submitted my paperwork. And within three weeks, I was out processed out of the air force on a flight back. Wow. To, uh, to the U.S. to go for my first training camp with the Cowboys. And your story about your upbringing and your time in the military makes sense when they said that uh, 
you know, when Coach Johnson saw you and interacted with you, three things really stood out, attitude, character, and leadership. And that parlayed into a pretty successful NFL career. You won three Super Bowl rings with the, with the Cowboys in four years. You finished off your career with 27.5 sacks, six fumble recoveries. I really don't want to read this next one because I'm an Arizona Cardinals fan, and your one touchdown was against the Arizona Cardinals. Yeah. Uh, but what do you remember most about that Super Bowl run that you still kind of, uh, you know, hold cherish to this day? Yeah, it was three of my first four years in the league in the NFL were Super Bowl championship years. And he got to the point where I thought, you know, this is the way it's supposed to go. We're Every year. To... And the Cowboys that year were playing with a phenomenal amount of talent. I think there's seven Hall of Famers on those teams that I played with as teammates. But what I recall the most is I've never been around a group of more selfless individuals. You know, the all alpha males have the talent, and but they wanted to win games. Yeah. And, and looking at that, I learned, you know, it was very – similar to actually being in a fighter squadron with a bunch of, you know, alpha male fighter pilot types, guys that everybody's the best, you know, they want to prove it. They all work together. I mean, they compete voraciously, you know, against one another, but yet at the same time, when there's mission, there's a common mission, common purpose, and everything comes together as a team on that point in time. And I could draw other analogies uh, between the two, but, but for me, the, the, the biggest memories I had of that time were, you know, again, the transition, let alone the physical aspects. You know, it's like a mother after childbirth. You know, you, you, it's a painful process when you're going through it. But after you're done with it, you don't remember all the pain necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, for me, the transition going from being a fighter pilot living in England where, you know, if it got above 78 degrees, <clears throat> excuse me, in the summertime, there'd be people that died over there because they didn't have air conditioning going to Austin, Texas, where the, you know, summer temperatures were 95 plus degrees, 50, 60% humidity. I would lose up to 12, 14 pounds per practice in a two hour practice period and have to gain all that back, you know, take IVs just to prevent cramping. So it, as well as, you know, competing against guys, as I said, seven Hall of four future Hall of Famers competing yeah. against these guys. When I hadn't played the game in four years, now I got to up my game from a collegiate level to a professional level. As I'm saying, it's, it was challenging. Yeah. But yet looking back on it, it was probably one of the most worthwhile periods of my life that, um, and it really, it, it, it honed who I am today from a character, from a commitment standpoint, even more so from my life experiences prior to that. Yeah, and it's got to be nice to walk in a room with those three rings. I've seen the pictures online. The, the one like that, I was like, I would do the same pose if I had that. Uh, so after your career is over with nine seasons with the team, uh, you have still continued just to do some remarkable things. And a couple of them I want to touch on real quick. Uh, you're an author, Forces of Character, Rules of Engagement, and It Takes Commitment. Uh, tell us about your books. Um, I was approached... Um you know, midway through my playing years with the Cowboys for the first book, It Takes Commitment because of my story, my journey of, of being fulfilling commitment, giving your word, et cetera. And this was a book written by or published by Multnomah and it was geared towards uh, adolescents to, you know, teens to, you know, preteen young adult on just the concept of commitment and the importance of living that holistic life of, you know, mind, body, spirit, as, as I said, you mentioned earlier, I'm, as a Christian, the importance of faith in regards to that too. Um, my second book, Rules of Engagement, was a book that I had learned that I wanted to write due to experiences I had from a nonprofit that I started called Wingman, where it was a mentorship discipleship nonprofit, faith-based, again, Christian, encouraging men, you know, what the, the relationship I had as with my wingman, this is the thing that translated, you know, into my experience now as, you know, as a husband, as a father. Yeah. And these are some of the life lessons that I learned from that. In my third book, Forces of Character was a book. I'm a big character guy, character yeah. leadership guy. And I wanted to tell stories about other people's journeys. So in that book, 
<clears throat> I sat down, I had conversations with 10 people that had a personal impact in my life. Some names trip you'd recognize, you know, Roger Staubach, Troy and Jason yeah. here, Greg Popovich, coach for the Spurs, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. I interviewed a survivor of Auschwitz, an international human rights attorney from former communist Romania, an astronaut, uh, uh, a homelessness expert here in Dallas, and the CEO for the National Center on Fathering. Wow. You know, individuals, male, female, black, white, you know, different uh, up and down the economic scale, but they all had one thing in common. They were individuals of character and purpose. And it just, who were their mentors? You know, what lessons in life did they learn from a character perspective? And it's kind of their individual stories. And that to me was, was the funnest one to write because you don't want to write about yourself. I'd rather tell other people's stories too. Yeah. If our listeners want to grab a copy of all three of those books, where can they go to? My website, chadheadings.com. All right. Perfect. And we'll have that in the episode description as well. Uh, tell us about what got you into motivational speaking. I think I've always been kind of a storyteller, a jokester per se. And I think just based on my background, the experiences I had, I wanted, I realized that a part of my legacy in life is not necessarily the things that I've accomplished or the material possessions I've accumulated. It's, I truly believe our legacy is built on relationships, those people mm -hmm. we've been able to impact. So that's why I, I speak to a variety of audiences, whether that's you know Fortune 500 corporate audiences or youth or uh, faith-based audiences, trying to motivate them on the purpose of knowing who you are, identity, and the purpose of where core values and character comes into, you know, walking that journey in life out. What do you think has been the most impactful moment post NFL career for you? Oh man, it's kind of like asking me which one of my kids I love more. <laughs> it, it's, you know, there's, there's been so many, I'm a firm believer that you know, certain things happen for a reason and we can take all of our experiences and turn them into the good, even if they're perceived at the time to be bad. And this is where I've, you know, the, what I have learned the most that I have learned in life from a lesson standpoint are those times of obstacles or pain and my inability to overcome certain pain and or obstacles. And that's, those are the ones that stick with me. I don't go back and think about the, uh, the Super Bowl victories. I go back and think about the times in the weight room, the times where I'm paying the price to mm. that. I think about the times where I was deployed in insulin, <clears throat> working out in their weight room four days a week, pumping iron and, you know, not knowing what the tomorrow was going to be hold, not even knowing that I was going to be able to play in the NFL in just a few months from that time period, but paying that price in anticipation of that happening at some point in time. Well, sir, I think you have a truly remarkable journey. I, I could probably have stretched this out to like a, a three hour episode with everything that you have going on in, in your life and your career. But looking back, uh, what is the one thing that you discovered about yourself up to this point in your life? You know, the one thing that I would say, it's, it's, uh, it's not about me. Pure and simple. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it was always that aspect of trying to now in, in life, it's being the best husband to be the best father to being the best friend, uh, the teammate that I can be. And it's, it's not about me. And, and that attitude and that mindset have served me well over my 55 years in, on this earth. And that's what I want other people to grasp, that there's got to be more than life than just making a buck. And your identity, you know, what you do does not define who you are. And when you can find that identity and, and that purpose and when realizing it's not about you, that's where true fulfillment in life and, and joy can be found. Good stuff. Yeah. And one more time, chadhennings.com. If you want to check out all the amazing things he's doing, sir, what final comments do you have for our audience? You know, just that is that let's, our country goes through this, is going through this period of, of division and isolation and marginalization that, you know, as Americans, particularly for your audience and those in the military, realize why did you sign up to serve? and keep that at the forefront and um, that will serve you well. 
sir. I appreciate you taking time to be here. Uh, I know you have an extremely busy schedule, folks. That is going to conclude this episode of the Shadows Podcast.